Tiki Hut Media. Pop the top on your favorite beer or whatever you drink from Tiki Hut Media. This is Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Hey there, welcome into Soul Ramblings. I'm Jerry, got my beer popped open and ready for this week's episode. And this week is week two of Advent, the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And today we'll be talking about pointing to Christ. I've also got a couple of things I want to just rant about today. Things that we Christians say that we really need to stop saying. So I'm going to rant about that a little bit coming up here in a few minutes. And I just want to take time out and say thank you for subscribing and supporting Soul Ramblings Podcast on Substack. Seriously, I mean, no one, me included, wants to get more email in our inbox. And I appreciate the privilege of you inviting me into your inbox. And I hope your headspace, too. As a free subscriber, you'll get updates. You'll get updates weekly in your inbox including blog posts, devotionals, and alerts when a new episode of the podcast drops. And you can even listen to the podcast in your inbox. You don't have to go to your player. You can just listen in your inbox. Soul Ramblings is supported by generous readers and listeners like you. We have no grants, no ads, no institutional backers. We don't do any list selling or anything like that. And I know during these economic times that we're going through, listen, I know paying for every podcast and blog you like, you just can't do it. It's not in the cards for everyone. And I know I can't afford to pay for everyone that I love. However, if you can afford it, would you please consider a paid subscription to help keep us going? I would really, really appreciate it. It's $5 a month or $50 a year. If you can't afford it, there's no explanation required, no worries, I want you to continue to read, listen, and engage for free. You can always see everything on our website, on Substack. Got a link in the show notes of this episode. And remember, everything we do here is meant to be shared. So please feel free to do so right now from if you already get the email or from the website if you haven't signed up yet. And be sure to tell your friends about Soul Ramblings. Either way, whether you subscribe for free or a paid subscription on Substack. Grab a beer. Come on in. All are welcome. And I want to thank you for being here. As I said, this Sunday is week two of Advent, and we're talking about pointing to Christ. And it's a challenge every year during this time of year in Advent leading up to Christmas. I mean, we all know the story. We've all seen the Christmas pageants. We've set up the nativity scenes with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, a cow, a donkey, shepherds, all of that. It's become almost too familiar. And so the challenge is to hear something new and fresh in this familiar story we all know. And in part, that's why we have the season of Advent. These four weeks serve to prepare the way to Christmas in a bit of a wilderness, if you will. The season provides a time of reflection and contemplation so that we can hear the good news of Jesus' birth, almost like for the first time, and let the gospel sink more deeply into our lives. This year, like many years, has been full of novel first-time experiences and change and lots of things going on. And every little thing is cast in a new perspective now. And yet, while the harshness of the wilderness of this past year may be felt more deeply this time around, the same ageless truths remain constant. We're just able to see them more clearly. The fundamental truth of these wilderness seasons is that we are waiting on an imperfect and broken world to pass. This season of Advent reminds us that No matter who we are or where we are in time and space, all earthly things will come to an end. Nearly 30 centuries ago, Isaiah wrote to God's exiled people who were longing to go back home, return home. And it's in Isaiah 40 that we find God's message to them as being one of comfort. The Lord is coming. 
And on the first hearing, Isaiah's message hardly seems to be one of comfort. He says the grass withers, the flowers fade. Surely the people are grass. That doesn't sound like a fairy tale ending, and it's not. The comfort offered in these verses is more complex than a happily ever after fairy tale. The comfort comes by putting things into a divine and cosmic perspective. Here's what I mean. All people will fade like grass, but God is mighty and he endures forever. The goodness of God will prevail. Now, the prophet Isaiah doesn't give an immediate time frame or an immediate solution to the heartbreak and suffering of the people in exile. What is offered is a message of hope for the future. Over in 2 Peter, that letter was written to a people who were longing for God's return. Uh, Peter's message is not unlike Isaiah's. He says over in 2 Peter chapter 3, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire. He's saying all things will, in the end, pass away. And in the end, God's justice will prevail. Now, while we don't know the exact date Peter wrote this, we do know that this letter was written to the fledgling Christian community experiencing persecution at the hands of the ruling empire. They're looking for Jesus' return and immediate relief from their suffering. But God does not come down with thunder from the clouds and triumphant material salvation. No, instead, God's word instructs that early church to step back and seek a divine and cosmic perspective. A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to God. Again, this doesn't seem like a happy fairy tale message for people who are going through immediate pain and anguish. The author, Peter, goes so far as to say that God's lack of thunderous return is not to cause more suffering, but instead, it's an act of love and patience. So, once again, we're given a word of hope for the future. But we're also given instructions on how to live in the present because he says, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish. And over in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, without much prelude or fanfare, Mark is an interesting gospel. It's one of the, well, it is the only gospel who just jumps right, it just jumps right in there and gets right to the action. And we are in the action in the desert as we start out in Mark's gospel. John the Baptist proclaims in the wilderness that familiar message. At this point in history, Israel had been invaded and they were occupied by the Roman Empire. And now John comes proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There's a bunch of crowds flocking to John, and Mark says people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. Now, John still points away from himself and towards someone greater to come. John points to a hopeful future by promising one who will come baptizing not with mere water, but with the Holy Spirit. So we see throughout in the Old Testament and the New Testament that waiting is not just a passive action. We don't sit back and cross our arms and wait. We are to live out our hope. In waiting for the fullness of the kingdom of God, we proclaim God's message of justice. We name sin. We turn toward justice. We stand in the wilderness pointing to the one more powerful than we are. And as the psalmist writes in Psalm 85, righteousness shall go before him and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. In other words, where righteousness and peace are actively enacted, that's where God is. So our Advent message from John, is, John the Baptist, that is, is not to adopt a, you know, a bug and honey diet like he had or declutter the closet to make room for camel skins. No, the message isn't even to level mountains or make a straight highway running through the desert. No, our Advent message is that we are called to be a people that await the coming of the Lord. We are always in waiting through victory and defeat, triumph and loss. It's certainly our job as a church to proclaim peace on earth, goodwill toward all, and joy to the world. But it is just as much our job to be visible in the wilderness, naming injustice, oppression, 
and apathy as sin. We name these things as sin not to throw judgment or shade or humiliate or ridicule, and least of all do we name sin in order to exclude people from our so-called in-group. It is precisely the opposite. We stand in the wilderness and welcome all to journey with us in the power of the Holy Spirit. We point to something better. We point to Christ, the one who is more powerful, more patient, and more loving. We point to Christ, the one who is to come. So this Advent, many of us are already in the wilderness. Let's step back. Let's pray for a glimpse of the divine and cosmic perspective. We remember that all things here on earth are temporary, and we work to embody God's patience and love here in this world. Let our lives be shaped by our hope in the truth that God is coming. Let us live in such a way so that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Glory to God. Amen. couple of things that we Christians say, and I've, since we've moved back to Tennessee a couple of months ago, uh, it's been over three months ago now, I have experienced this, and I, I almost forgot in our 10 years in Florida, I forgot about this mindset, but there's a couple of things that we say, and the, the mindset that some Christians have, and they sound good, one of those is, I've heard this recently, love the sinner, hate the sin, or hate the sin, love the sinner, however you want to phrase it. It's one of those phrases that it's so baked into, especially Southern Christianity, it's almost shocking to discover that nowhere in the Bible will you find that phrase. I have to admit, at a, at a fundamental level, there's nothing really wrong about love the sinner, hate the sin. I mean, I understand that we're seeking to be more gracious uh, to the accusation that Christians are judgmental and intolerant. I mean, after all, we're all sinners, right? And God doesn't hate us. Love the sinner, hate the sin. It conveniently makes a distinction between the sinner and the sin. And this is one of the reasons the phrase seems to be so attractive to so many Christians. It gives the appearance of generosity without the need to sacrifice or honestly wrestle with our own convictions. However, while it is spoken with the best intentions, love the sinner, hate the sin often ends up being more beneficial to the person saying the words than it is to the person who hears the words. To me, uh, the saying implies when you say love the sinner, hate the sin, I hear this. I'm a good person because I'm loving you in spite of your sin. Now, to the person on the receiving end of love the sinner, hate the sin, it can sound judgmental, condescending, manipulative. Here's what I mean. It highlights the virtues of one person against the perceived sinfulness of another, conveniently placing the lover, the, the person saying the phrase, in a position of being like morally superior over this sinner. It's not compassion, and it's definitely not grace. In a powerful story found over in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus forgives the sins of a crippled man after the man's friends cut a hole in the ceiling, and the house was packed, and they lowered the man in front of this controversial rabbi. And Jesus tells the man that his sins are forgiven. And a lot of the religious people, a lot of the church folk, if you will, in attendance, they got very pissed off. They got upset. It was already a system in place to forgive people of their sins, and it was established by God in the Old Testament. Everyone owed a sin debt to God, and the only way to repay that debt was to make a blood sacrifice at the temple, and that was a holy place where it was believed heaven and earth overlapped. And a sidebar here, I'm going to give you this one for free. <laughs> I believe the church needs to be that holy place, a holy place where it, where, where heaven and earth overlap. That's where we experience that. Okay, back to my point. Jesus was doing something different here, though. 
the religious leaders and priests were scandalized. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Not just because Jesus offered to forgive sins, but because he was forgiving sins before the biblically required payment was made. That's what hacked them off. And this was no subtle shift in thinking. It would have completely turned the religious system of Jesus' day on its head. No wonder the Pharisees and the teachers were so pissed off by Jesus' proclamation. Peter Rollins wrote a book called The Orthodox Heretic, and there's a quote in there I want you to hear. He says, Jesus' understanding of forgiveness was so radical because he did not need people to repent before he accepted them. He did not require a change in behavior before he loved, respected, and related to them. Yet it was precisely this unconditional love and forgiveness that seemed so potent and transformative, often being the very act that drew people to repentance. That's an awesome quote, and one that bears repeating again and again, because we tend to treat forgiveness as a transaction. We withhold it until certain conditions are met or promised to be met. Transactional forgiveness hinges on the assumption that a person will be worth forgiving in the future. One of my childhood heroes, I always watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood when I was a kid, and he said this at one point, Fred Rogers did, to love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is, right here, right now. Grace is contrary to our nature. We don't trust it because it sounds foolish and dangerous. By experience, we know the world doesn't play by the rules of grace. But, you know, to be honest, grace should be a little dangerous. It's a risky thing. But because we fear grace, we shy away from it and settle for this cheap transaction instead. Limiting grace's ability to do its wondrous work in ourselves and other people. And sometimes you'll take a hit. Grace has a tendency to look like failure at the moment because you often get nothing in return. We should never forget, though, that Jesus died forgiving the very people who were crucifying him. But grace doesn't mean we absolve people of the natural consequences of their actions or that we should turn a blind eye toward injustice or that we shouldn't put up boundaries to protect ourselves and other people from dangerous situations or toxic relationships. The mark of sin is unnecessary pain against yourself and others. Grace is messy and complicated, and it's fraught with peril, but it's not foolish or enabling. And that's why grace is just as much a communal experience as it is an individual response. And here's what I mean. Over in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told his disciples that one of the greatest commandments was to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say, love the sinner as yourself. Love the sinner, hate the sin, sabotages grace because it trains you to see people who think and live differently than you as sinners rather than neighbors. See the difference? Instead of seeking out neighbors to love, we become predisposed to be on the lookout for sin to hate. During the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actively challenged that mindset when he said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And if we're completely honest, love the sin or hate the sin is most likely every time I've heard it, it's invoked by a Christian in conversations or sermons about or against gay marriage, same-sex relationships, and other culture war flashpoints. It's never used to condemn greed, materialism, gluttony, consumerism, gossip, divorce, or any of the other sins that sit so comfortably in our pews. Instead, love the sin or hate the sin becomes this callous, tough love type thing that sometimes been have, it's been used to justify discrimination and tolerance and exclusion. So when we use love the sinner, hate the sin as a shield to hide our condemnation and self-righteousness, we betray our true intent. In the Gospels, a group of religious leaders drag a woman caught in the act of adultery and throw her at Jesus' feet. And according to the law in the book of Exodus, a woman should be stoned to death for infidelity. Jesus was known as a teacher of mercy, and so these religious folk were 
looking to see how Jesus would interpret one of the harshest commandments in the law. Instead of following through with that biblical law, Jesus kneels down, starts doodling in the dirt or sand or whatever, and tells the religious leaders, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Now, I'm sure those religious leaders could have made a convincing case that stoning the woman would have been the most righteous and loving thing to do. After all, it would have helped blot out the indignity and threat of sexual promiscuity from the community. And we like to think of the Pharisees and the scribes as the bad guys of the Gospels, but they're just doing their jobs. They're just following the rules, and they were given to them by God a few thousand years ago. We're told that Jesus lived a sinless life, and he did. According to his own challenge, Jesus should have been the one to chunk the first stone at that woman. But he didn't. He broke the rules. In her book, Searching for Sunday, Rachel Held Evans writes, uh, or did write, about a how graceless Christians like to hone in on Jesus' final instruction to the woman, where he says, go and sin no more, at the expense of the redemptive core of the story. Here's what she says in the book. So how's that working out for you, she says. The sinning no more thing? Because it's not going so well for me. I think it's safe to say we've missed the point when, of all the people in this account, we decide we're most like Jesus. I think it's safe to say we've missed the point when we use his words to condemn and this story as a stone. Now, of course, there's a time and a place for speaking in truth and love and confronting someone's sin in someone's life. But Christians have already proven themselves pretty adept at that part of the equation. We're prone to confusing judgment with condemnation. To condemn someone is to reduce a person to the worst parts of themselves. Condemnation never softens a heart. It only hardens. Grace, however, does exactly the opposite. Philip Yancey wrote in What's So Amazing About Grace, he said, Grace teaches us that God loves because of who God is, not because of who we are. So it's time to retire this love the sinner, hate the sin BS. It's manipulative and it is associated with bigotry and intolerance. The phrase casts ourselves in the role of being morally superior, and we lean far more on judgment than love when we say that. A better motivating philosophy would be, love the sinner, forgive the sin. Jesus illustrates this perfectly in the Gospel of Matthew and in a parable. He said, a man had a large debt, forgiven by the king. However, as the recently forgiven man is leaving the palace, he encounters a servant who owes him a little bit of money. Instead of extending the king's spirit of forgiveness, the man demands the servant pay him what he owes. When the king gets wind of this ungracious behavior, he has the man arrested, thrown into jail. And Jesus ends the parable by saying, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Another improvement of forgive the sin over hate the sin is that it shifts our focus away from being card carrying members of the morality police and toward being what Paul called ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. When people sought out and encountered Jesus in the Gospels, they didn't do so to be told how bad or sinful they were. There were plenty of religious folks they could have turned to for that. People flocked to Jesus because he spoke of a new way of doing life with God and other people. It wasn't, as theologian Dallas Willard puts it, a gospel of sin management. True gospel transformation doesn't begin with judgment. It begins and ends with a startling revelation that through the sacrificial death of Jesus, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. In light of this truth, we Christians should be the least self-righteous and most welcoming group of people on the planet. Instead, we're really good at making people feel as if they don't belong in our religious social clubs. And maybe if we pivoted away from love the sin or hate the sin 
and more toward love the sinner, forgive the sin, we'd become known more for our warmth and grace than our anger and judgment. Maybe, just maybe. Okay, one more thing that I told you that I told you earlier, I got a couple of things that Christians say and the mindset, the thinking of some Christians, it really gets on my nerves. And these are things that I consider to be a bullshit, a bullshit, a bullshit. And the second one is this. This is a prevailing thinking in, in the area that I live in, especially. I was at Beth and I had to attend a, a funeral of a distant relative a couple of months ago. And the guy that was delivering the eulogy made a comment during the eulogy when he said, you know, he was a good spiritual man. He's a good Christian man. Uh, he didn't go to church. But can I tell you, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he said, can I tell you that church attendance won't get you into heaven? A relationship with Jesus Christ will. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I've heard some televangelists say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That, that doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. And while there is there is some nugget of truth to that, I've always struggled with that. I mean, do we really need to go to church every Sunday? Well, maybe not. But for generation after generation, I know when I was growing up, church was this legalistic ritual expectation. It's what you did on Sunday morning. And the dominant motivation for spiritual activity, whether it was reading the Bible, praying, going to church, it was more out of obligation or duty. We did what we did because we thought that's what we were supposed to do. And for a long time, we really didn't question that. And that has changed over the past couple of decades, more than a couple of decades. We started asking questions. We realized that anything we did out of obligation or duty ended up feeling pretty empty. And it did. For so long, the church developed this idea that in order to have a relationship with God, you had to come to church regularly. Some places, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the church I went to gave out perfect attendance pens for people who made it to church every week. For us, it was Sunday school. I had a couple of them. But the mistake of the Christian leaders during that time was drawing this parallel between our relationship with God and our church attendance. We said or implied by our expectations that if you didn't go to church every week, you couldn't really know or love God. So I get the understanding there. That's where we were as a society. But what is happening in society today is this swing against that. The idea that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, is flooding our culture. And it's doing so because for many years, many churches relied on the wrong motivation to get the right response. Think of church attendance like doing good works. If our motivation for doing the good works is to try and earn our salvation or prove ourselves worthy of God, then those works are self-righteous and they are worthless. If our motivation for those good works is to demonstrate our love for God in response to his grace and mercy, then they are fruits of our faith. So it's motivation. The motivation changes everything. Good works are not tools to earn our salvation. They are our natural response to salvation. Church attendance works in the same way. When we make it about what we are supposed to do, then it becomes an empty religious practice. It's just something we do. When we invest ourselves in the church because we recognize it's an opportunity to grow closer to God through relationships with his people and our motivation is to have more of God in our lives, then that same action shifts from being a chore to a joy. The question is, do we really need to go to church? The best place to look for the answer is to see what the Bible says. So if we start in Acts chapter 2, we see that we're given a picture of the church before the sinfulness and selfishness of modern people corrupted it. We're told that the church was devoted to the fellowship of believers. It's one of the four primary things 
the early church prioritized. The essential text to answer this question, though, do we really need to go to church, comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So, we have a biblical command that says not to neglect meeting together. It's not being ambiguous. There's no hidden language there. Hebrews clearly tells us that we need to make the community of God a priority in our lives. Add to that what Jesus says in John fourteen fifteen: If you love me, keep my commands. And what you have is a pretty strong imperative to engage in godly community. It gets even better. In the second century, community was a lifestyle. Community was a daily thing. To the original audience of the letter of Hebrews, only meeting once a week would have been to neglect meeting together. But society changes, culture changes, and as such, so can the application of a certain text. And that's the case here. But the principle of the message here is clear. The people of God should be invested in and treat the community of God as a priority. I understand the objections. I get it. The concerns. The church is full of broken, messed up people. The church can be challenging. It can be frustrating. It's full of hypocrites. There are two things we need to understand about that. Those things are true of us as well. The person who doesn't go to church because it's full of hypocrites is just as much a hypocrite as the people they're objecting to. Those outside of the church claiming to be Christians are just as messed up and broken as those inside it. The difference is they're reducing the opportunities to grow and heal from that brokenness. I know a lot of people who use the argument, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And in fairness, they are right. But just like a fish doesn't have to be in water to be a fish, what happens to that fish when you take it out of the water for too long? Yeah. In my whole life, I've never met a mature, God-loving Christian who had a deep relationship with God and an understanding of his word who did not go to church. Anyone who truly connects with God, who grows in relationship with him, is going to be drawn in to invest in godly community. Those who know and love God, obey his instructions. God tells us to be engaged in the community of his church. The argument that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian is an argument, quite frankly, of immaturity. How can the church improve if the people who recognize the problem don't stay and fight for it? Imagine a world where all the doctors stopped going to hospitals because they realized how sick people were. Who would treat those sick people? Who would help them get better? If the people who recognize the problems avoid them, how will problems get fixed? Uh, Look, I love the church. I know it's not everything it should be. I have gone through some shit. I have experienced many of the nasty things that Christians do to each other. It is definitely not perfect. I admit that. Yet, in its imperfection, it has been the source of more refinement and growth in my life than any other relationship I've had. I understand life is busy. In fact, the world gets busier and faster each and every day. There will always be hundreds of things that demand our time and attention. There will often be things that sound more exciting and more fun than engaging in godly community. The funny thing about people is that we always manage to find time for our priorities. No matter how busy life gets, I find the time for Beth, my wife, because I make sure that's a priority. The question of church attendance is less about if we have to go and more about why we don't want to. What is it that keeps people from seeing godly community as a priority that is worth sacrificing for? While church is not perfect, it is the place in which God chooses to display his awesome power. The more we invest in it, the more we see the power of God at work through it.
I'd love to hear from you. You can email us at any time, soulramblingspodcast at gmail.com, soulramblingspodcast at gmail.com. Get social with us on our social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. Got links to those pages in the show notes of this episode. Also, during Advent and also any other time, we have a couple of Spotify playlists that you can listen to. Got links to those in the show notes. We've got a Christmas playlist and we've also got a regular playlist, two different playlists on Spotify. And if you use Spotify, you can follow those playlists and Shoot us, a, shoot us an email and let us know what you would like to hear on those playlists. Don't forget to go over and subscribe to our Substack page. Again, link in the show notes. And whether you listen on Spotify or if you listen on Google Podcast, Apple Music, Amazon Music, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, we are on so many different platforms. Wherever you're listening, would you let us know that? And also click subscribe. That way you never miss a new episode of Soul Ramblings Podcast. We went a bit long today because I had to rant about some... A bullshit? A bullshit? A bullshit. <laughs> so, uh, so we will wrap it up for this week. Next week, week three of Advent. And we leave you as we always do with Philippians 4, 8 from the Apostle Paul who says, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That brings us to the end of this episode of Soul Ramblings. We'll see you next week. Thank you for the gift and privilege of your time. I hope today's episode was beneficial and entertaining for you. I'm Jerry Wicker. Thanks for being here, and thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings Podcast. Grace, peace, cheers. cheers. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. Yeah.